Welcome to People and Profit. I'm Brian Quinn. Coming up, the luxury goods sector eyes a comeback as China reopens for business. But after years of pandemic doldrums, high-end manufacturers now must contend with a slowing global economy. Italy aims to revitalize struggling rural towns with a major infusion of cash from European pandemic recovery funds, a windfall, and a challenge for local officials. And Japanese steel, once forged into the world's finest swords, is taking the world's kitchens by storm as a pandemic-era cooking boom translates into skyrocketing sales of premium knives. But can Japan's cutlery masters keep up with demand? Is the luxury sector recession-proof? Sales at high-end brands plunged at the start of the pandemic as countries went into lockdown, but they've since rebounded sharply, even as inflation soars and economic growth slows. Now many fashion houses hope that China's reopening will be another boon to their business. Our business editor, Kate Moody, sat down with Rashid Mohammed Rashid, chairman of the investment group behind brands like Valentino and Balmain, on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos. We were all uh, expecting uh, the sector to be acting more like the rest of the economy, especially after the pandemic. But the reality has been contrary to that. We have seen a big surge in consumption uh, in the markets which have been back to normal, like uh, Europe, like the US. Uh, the pandemic period, of course, have seen a dip. But uh, post that, we have seen a surge, in some cases increasing by 50, 60 percent. There is no doubt today that uh, the segment of the consumers who have affordability and the rich people, they're spending more. Rich people have more money to spend. We know that, you know, there have been a lot of cash injected in the market and rich people got a big share out of it. And I assume that also big, uh, a lot of rich people going through the emotional experience of the pandemic, they feel that, you know, death is possible. So they want to spend more money. And that is happening, I mean, that is happening everywhere. And we are hoping now with the opening of China that will also be in China too. Is there a particular region or a type of consumer where you see particular potential for growth? Well, I think uh, what we have seen in the last 20 years, a consistent growth across the world, but obviously the growth was much more significant in what we call the emerging market. China, for instance, have seen an, an a phenomenal growth. I mean, China, prior to the pandemic, had almost 35 percent market share, which is equivalent to almost Europe and the United States combined. But Asia in general is growing, Latin America is growing, the Middle East is growing. And why is that? Because they were already a very uh, significant base of consumption of luxury in Europe, United States and Japan. But the rest of the world really started to catch up. And that's what we call the democratization of luxury when all this new middle class and uh, higher, higher uh, level of income uh, started to spread across the emerging market, it became very, very important. Yeah. One of the things that makes luxury different from the rest of the retail industry is that it doesn't have the same online appeal. People don't go online shopping for luxury goods. There's something very tactile about the experience of investing in a luxury piece. That is very true because obviously uh, if you are a consumer of luxury, you want to have the full experience. You want to go to the store, you want to feel the products, you want to touch the products, you want to have also uh, the, the whole ambiance that have been created. And we know that luxury companies in general, not only in the soft uh, luxury, which is uh, fashion, but whether it's a hard luxury like jewelry and uh, watches, or even luxury like cars and, and boats, they are spending tremendous amount of money to create that experience for the consumer which cannot be, at the moment, replicated in the, on the online. What's your take on the trend of consolidation within the luxury sector when we see more and more iconic brands coming together under one corporate umbrella? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's definitely something that has been uh, progressing significantly in the last uh, two decades. And we, we, we are witnessing, of course, some very significant groups today I wouldn't say dominating, but definitely playing the leading role on, on the luxury side. I think that trend is going to continue. But at the same time, we have to be aware that luxury is fed through creativity, and creativity doesn't stop. So while there is a consolidation at the top, but at the same time, there is always newcomers, and there is always new ideas, and there is always uh, very beautiful creative ideas coming to the market. 
And I think uh, that is also the, the power and the beauty of luxury, that it, it feeds on the creativity of the human beings, yeah. Valentino is one of the brands uh, that's involved in an upcycling program of reselling, reusing high-end material. What role do you see for the fashion industry and perhaps for the luxury sector in particular in the issue of sustainability? Well, sustainability became a very, very important issue for fashion and for luxury in general because it's very important for everybody. It's important for our life, it's important for our economy, it's important for the feeling even of, of people, especially the young people. We, we embarked in all our companies in initiatives for uh, sustainability. Uh, so that is what we call green fashion initiatives at the moment, where we are uh, maximizing the use of recycled material, maximizing the use of degradable uh, material, because we are very much conscious that uh, the, the, the waste coming out of fashion is becoming a very re real issue. But at the same time, as you mentioned, there is a very strong trend today, especially on the luxury side, not only for Valentino and Balmain, but also for all the big companies, that the second-hand market is becoming very important. And, and, uh, and, and vintage, as we call it, is becoming really something that many of the companies, including ourselves, uh, are considering as ideas how really to, to make it more and more commercially viable for the big companies. So small companies, small initiatives are dealing with that, but also we are looking at, at uh, ways and means that we can really control and make it much more accessible to the people. Of course, people are concerned about uh, having the right products. They don't want to have fake products. They, want to, they don't want to have you know, products which don't have the real value. And I think that part is very important for the luxury companies to be involved in, yeah. Rashid Mohamed Rashid, thank you so much for being on France 24 today. Thank you very much. Italy's economy was one of the hardest hit by the COVID pandemic in Europe, with a drop in GDP of 9% in 2020. The country is now set to be the top beneficiary of the EU's 750 billion euro COVID recovery plan with more than 191 billion euros. As Rome moves to allocate those funds, it's launching an ambitious program to revitalize rural areas, allotting some 420 million euros to investments in countryside villages. Managing the money, though, will be a major challenge for local authorities. Our correspondent in Italy, Natalia Mendoza, tells us more. The village of Cessi, at the foothills of the Apennines in central Italy, a picture-perfect village that has just won the jackpot, selected by the regional government of Umbria to receive 20 million euros from the European Recovery Plan. The aim? To transform the village into a tourist destination. We want to encourage outdoor sports. The project involves opening up the mountain, connecting the village to the panoramic viewpoint by rebuilding the road. Hiking trails, a climbing area and approximately 30 kilometers of cycle paths will be created. It will help develop nature-based tourism in the area, cycling or walking. That will benefit other sectors who will get more work because the visitors will need to sleep and eat somewhere. The European funding will also help to improve local services. This abandoned 17th century convent will be transformed. Nearly 3 million euros will be spent on it. Everything here needs to be renovated. The idea is to build a residential center for senior citizens, a design school and rent-controlled social housing for young couples. The town council must respect certain conditions imposed by the European Commission. The works must be completed by 2026. The infrastructure will be completely rethought, depending on the project, to highlight the appeal of the village and promote general development of the whole region. 150 people live in Chessy. They hope that the project will revitalize their village and highlight its cultural heritage. The Japanese city of Seki was once famous for its samurai swords. As a combination of high-quality iron ore, charcoal and crystal clear water combined with steel folding techniques to produce some of the world's finest blades. Now craftsmen are using those same advantages to equip the world's top kitchens with precise razor-sharp knives. But in the wake of a pandemic cooking boom, they're having trouble keeping up with demand. Charlie James takes us inside one top producer. Sparks fly, steel grinds, the sounds of some of the most coveted knives in the world being made by hand. 
With a tradition rooted in sword making, the Japanese city of Seki has been crafting knives for 800 years. Today, its producers can't keep up with the demand. I think the combination of technology and traditional craftsmanship is one of the reasons why Japanese knives are now recognized around the world. The rise of the home chef during the pandemic spurred interest in Japanese knives. Renowned for strength and longevity, their popularity has also grown with professional chefs over the decades. Japanese knife making is truly an art. They are perfectly sharp and precise. In fact, the better the knives are maintained, the more precise they are. Of course, it is very important when cooking. It avoids wasting time. The export value of Japanese bladed kitchen tools, such as knives and scissors, hit a record 85 million euros in 2021, a 30% jump from the previous year. A top quality Japanese kitchen knife can be priced in the hundreds of euros, while specialty knives, such as this one for cutting soba noodles, can easily top 1,000 euros each. Post-pandemic, people may cook at home less, but their Japanese knives will still stand the test of time. That's it for now. Remember, you can find this episode and all our previous shows on the France 24 website or as a podcast wherever you usually listen. You can also get in touch with your comments or questions on social media. Till next time, thanks for watching. A program about women who are reshaping our world. We meet those who seek equality, be it in the boardroom or at the village well. The 51% brings you stories from across the globe about the women who are challenging the way we think. The 51% presented by Annette Young on France 24 and France24.com.